Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar, Family Resources for Nutrition and Exercise, hosted by the Greenwich Hospital Medical Library. Um, I'm Veronica Belenkin, the Consumer Health Librarian at Greenwich Hospital. Tonight's webinar is very special indeed for those of you able to uh, attend the live session. This is the first uh, webinar for the 2021 year, and it is also the first of my webinars where I am having a guest expert from Yale New Haven Health. Um, as you can see, we are joined by Sarah Griffin, pediatric clinical dietitian too, from who works at Greenwich Hospital's uh, Pediatric Specialty Center here in Greenwich. So, so every, everybody will be able to get some expertise, some very good expertise from her tonight. Um, for those of you who are unable to attend this session, you will be able to see a recording of this um, after the fact on my website, the Dr. Stephen Mickley Consumer Health section. I will show you how to reach that um, uh, in the Q&A portion of this presentation. Speaking of the Q&A portion of the presentation, that is where you will be able to ask questions should you feel the need to after the fact of the presentation. So uh, please save your questions for the end and Sarah and I will definitely take them through the chat feature on your Zoom webpage. So before I begin, I always um, start my presentations with a disclaimer just clarifying that this presentation is for educational and informational purposes only. Please always consult your doctor or other healthcare provider for medical advice before making any lifestyle decisions that may impact your health. You can certainly use the resources that we speak about today. You can use the expertise that Sarah and I share and uh, promote a discussion with your healthcare provider, but please do not take any of this as a substitute for a diagnosis. And all of the images used in this presentation are sourced from reliable websites and are licensed under the Creative Commons copyright. So they are free to use. The topics that we're gonna be covering today are under the umbrella of children's nutrition. Um, we will try to condense it as much as possible as we are know we are under a time limit. So the first we are doing is going over how to find the recommended nutrition intake for children and adolescents. Then we are going over children-specific health education. These are websites that can be easily accessed and understood by children and also provide educational games and recipes and such for children. Websites with kid-friendly recipes and kid-friendly is the umbrella term that people use to describe recipes that are incorporate uh, food that kids love but are still healthy and they're easy for children to make in the kitchen as well. We also have websites with physical activity tips and suggestions. And then we have websites for um, children's nutrition under special circumstances, such as healthy eating during a pandemic, um, how to eat healthy when children, your children has allergies or asthma, uh, whether your children are picky eaters, which is what a lot of the registrants tonight spoke about in the questionnaire. So I'm sure they'll wanna tune in for that especially. Last but not least, we are going to go over state and local support resources. Um, due to the fact that I am based in Greenwich, I do primarily uh, talk about Connecticut state and local resources, but don't let that stop you, uh, you Westchester residents from also looking into them because the tips in there are applicable to anywhere, no matter what location you're in. And then these are the four websites I definitely want you guys to keep in mind as I will be mentioning them a lot during the presentation. First over here, we have choosemyplate.gov. This plate over here is basically the evolution of the food pyramid that many of us were probably very familiar with growing up. Um, after Michelle Obama's campaign, you know, against childhood obesity, the department, US Department of Agriculture took it upon themselves to rework the pyramid into a plate shape instead in order to reorganize the um, amounts of each food group you're supposed to have and also put an emphasis on food portion control. So we'll be going over that later. Um, and the next website that's really important to know is the CDC. I'm sure everybody's heard of that already a pretty sick of hearing it because of COVID-19, but um, Center for Disease Control and Prevention has a lot of tips on a lot of health conditions, including nutrition. 
Then we're also going to talk about um, NEMORS. They have a run a website called Kids Health. NEMORS is a nonprofit organization based in Florida uh, that specifically with the purpose of um, improving children's health. And then last but not least, our next uh, other website that we'll be talking about is the National Heart and Blood and Lung Institute. So quick introductions um, about your hosts for tonight. That's me, <laughs> if you can't tell. Um, the librarian, my name is Veronica Blinken and I'm the consumer health librarian at Greenwich Hospital. For those who might not know what that is, or what that entails. A consumer health librarian helps find and evaluate and share health information, whether that be print or digital. For example, just today I um, helped, I was helping somebody research alternatives to a surgery that she was recommended by her doctor for a renal eye issue. Um, she wanted to discuss other options with her doctor and wanted me to research for her those different options and how effective they were. So most of the time I've, I've helped people with regards to that and also um, look up diets, look up any kind of other medical conditions, what their medications do, that kind of thing. So I graduated with a master's in library science from Queens College and I started this job two years ago. Uh, since then, I've also gained a consumer health certification from the Medical Library Association. The three platforms that I tried that I'm very passionate about with concerns of my job is health literacy, um, health prevention, and patient advocacy. And as a Greenwich resident, I am very in tune with the community that I serve and want to provide as much help as possible. And outside of work, I enjoy walking and listening to audiobooks, my two favorite genres being biographies and science fiction. So I'm going to put the floor over to Sarah, our clinical pediatric nutritionist, so that she can tell a little bit about herself. You have the floor, Sarah. Thanks, Veronica. Um, I am a registered dietitian, and as you can tell by Veronica's screen, we're currently celebrating National Nutrition Month, so this is one of my favorite months as a registered dietitian. I did my training at Yale New Haven Hospital through their dietetic internship while I pursued my master's in human nutrition. As Veronica said at the beginning of the presentation, I currently work at the Yale Pediatric Specialty Center right here in Greenwich. I work with pediatric patients of all ages um, with varying conditions from celiac disease and obesity to picky eating and children with difficulty gaining weight. I understand that feeding children can be difficult and I aim to help parents so that they feel empowered and confident while they're able to raise children who are confident and growing eaters. Thank you, Sarah. And um, feel free to chime in and any slide that we have going forward. And uh, what, with regards to um, childhood obesity, um, I think a lot of people are not aware of what the state of childhood obesity is right now in the United States. So I would like to share with you some of the research that I found as I made this PowerPoint. So there were certain studies that I tried to find with the last five years that tried to tell me what it was like right now. Should we be worried? What, how does COVID-19 and staying inside kind of impact that? So um, according to the most recent CDC National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which they do every few years, Childhood obesity rates in the U.S. have increased from 13.9% in the 2000s to 185 in 2016. And the source for that is the State of Obesity Report from 2018. Um, there was also a scientific journal, Pediatrics, that published a 2018 study that showed that um, child and adolescent obesity continues to grow in the United States despite significant public health initiatives because we, we've all heard about these initiatives and though try as we might, there's still issues going on, um, particularly with preschool age children and those who are black or Hispanic. In Connecticut specifically, and also particularly Fairfield County in which Greenwich is involved, in Connecticut, 13.3% of youth ages 10 to 17 have obesity giving Connecticut a ranking of 32 among the 50 states and DC uh, with regards to childhood obesity. 
the 2018 Connecticut Childhood Obesity Report, which is compiled by the Connecticut Department of Health, highlighted four contributing factors of obesity amongst Connecticut teens. Uh, consumption of unhealthy foods and drinks, inadequate amount of physical activity, increased sedentary activity, such as video games, cell phone, and television, and not consuming enough fruits and vegetables in their diet. And the source for both of these is from the State of Childhood Obesity, Connecticut, and the Connecticut Department of Public Health. Last but not least, um, we have um, some studies that were shown uh, to be done in the past year, which projected the impact that COVID-19 and its guidelines would have on uh, childhood obesity rates. So there was a research journal, Obesity, where a 2020 article was published that predicted that COVID-19 school closing closings will increase U.S. childhood obesity rates due to excessive consumption of takeout and ultra processed foods, more sedentary activities such as virtual learning and lack of physical activities due to the lockdown on social distancing. Now, luckily with the vaccine that might not be as big of a problem anymore, but um, it's, it's basically the equivalent of a year long summer for some people and there have other studies that have shown that in the summer particularly is when children gain the most weight in in this as opposed to children who go to school all year long so you can imagine what kind of impact that would be anything to add sarah to these uh findings just to echo that last point of you know we were trying not to go to the grocery store as much so maybe we were buying more of those prepackaged products to have at home and then because they're home all day there's more of the snacking going on um, and of course there were times when we were really limiting going going outside and, and being outside the home which impacts our ability to be active luckily we've had some warm days recently so i, I hope that continues and like veronica said with the addition of the vaccine and other things that, that this will all improve. Thank you. That's a really important point. You know, the weather, who wants to go outside when it's like 30 degrees to like, I would, I'm normally am such a hermit in the winter anyway, even without the pandemic. So that makes sense. <clears throat> so moving on, um, obesity has, especially the way in which we've been diagnosing it has seen its share of controversy and skepticism from, I'm sure Sarah has had a lot of people, encounter a lot of people who are confused or unsure of what exactly constitutes obesity or makes it any different from being overweight. Um, from my perspective, when I researched it on the Medline Plus uh, online database, it defines obesity as having too much body fat a person's weight is greater than what's considered healthy for their height or age. And what's important to distinguish is that um, the way that uh, obesity is diagnosed in adults is different from how it's diagnosed in children. Um, and there is a difference between being obese and overweight. Both do describe excessive fat accumulation. Both are determined by BMI for age percentile or body mass index. And for children ages two to 19 years old, obesity is interpreted relative to other children of the same age and sex. So really a lot of comparisons to be had. Um, on this, if you look on the right over here, this is an example I found from the CDC uh, website that shows a sample um, of, of a boy from two to 20 years. Um, I don't have it on the PowerPoint here, but apparently, um, it's divided into four categories. The green is where you would normally want to see the children's BMI. Um, and then the red would be the obese area. Um, I can see Sarah nodding, so I'm assuming that I'm explaining this correctly. Um, but um, I will let her chime in right now just to get her perspective on it, because I'm sure you've had, I don't know if you use this chart or is there anything more recent? Because this chart is really old. It, it is old. Um, research in children is generally not plentiful. So this is the chart I generally use for those age 2 to 20. BMI is um, a measurement of those age 2 to 20. Under year, under two years, we use the WHO growth chart generally. Okay. And we look at something called weight for length, which is similar to BMI. It just doesn't use that same equation that BMI uses. And as Veronica pointed out, 
anything over the 95th percentile considered obese, above the 85th is um, overweight, between the 85th and the 5th is a normal weight, and under the 5th would be underweight. Um, of course, we can see children who are healthy at different percentiles, and we want to look that that child is following their own curve, following their own percentile, and what we might see right now is a child who is previously growing at the 75th percentile for weight has now increased to the 85th or the 90th percentile for weight. And that's when we, we look at lifestyle factors and things that have been going on to see what that change was. Um, additionally, as Veronica pointed out, the BMI itself is, that number is different for adults and for children. So as this chart nicely shows, when we talk about BMI for adult, that number is set, but when we talk about the BMI number for children, we're looking at the percentile and not that BMI number, because as you'll see from the chart, a 23, we might consider that normal for adults, but you can tell that it changes by age, whether that ranks them as obese or normal. Um, so it's less about that BMI number while we're still growing and more about where that BMI number puts you in terms of percentiles. Very well said. And I'm sure that there's a lot of parents that may come in and disagree entirely with your diagnosis, but it's, I, I know that there's like a really complex math equation also involved. So it can be, I'm sure it's really difficult to describe to um, their, the parents. Um, in my how, do you, how do you approach describing this to parents? At the, to simplify, it's a comparison of how much weight you carry for your height. The equation is a little bit um, more involved in that we take weight in kilometer, weight in kilograms, and we divide it by um, height in meters squared to get that BMI number, um, which which might sound complicated to parents who, who when we think in inches and pounds, um, but it's a pretty standard conversion. And is the BMI a perfect indicator of health? Certainly not. We know that. Um, it does not take into account muscle mass. And I'll touch on again, something I look for as a dietitian is, is this child growing normally for their curve? Are they maintaining their growth where they have, or are they accelerating or decelerating? And that's really where I put the most stock versus a number or um, a single data point. Yep, well said. Yeah, so a lot of people with the Bozzy positivity movement right now, they might see this and go, oh, this isn't, the, it's just, just a number. I know what I am. I know how healthy I am. So, but I, I like that you have a method that you, that you're really just telling them what the numbers show. And you're also telling them what they could possibly do in their lifestyle to make it a little bit lower. Sure. Because as um, the next bullet point will show, there are a lot of health risks associated with childhood obesity, um, up to and not including, uh, oh, and including high blood pressure and cholesterol leading to heart disease later in life. Um, movement is very difficult when you're obese, which can lead to joint problems. Um, an increased risk of developing prediabetes and type two diabetes is likely and um, more likely to become obese as an adult and therefore suffer more serious um, medical conditions. This is the what I got from the CDC. Um, is there anything you want to add with, with, with regards to health risks, Sarah? No, I, I, I see all of these things. And um, the sooner we can adjust some of those habits and prevent some of these things from worsening um, and being obese as adults, the better. So, uh, you know, early, early intervention is always helpful if patients and families are willing. And if we're being even more current, um, the CDC has also specified that obese adults are more susceptible to um, fatality from COVID-19. Is that correct? It's my understanding. Yeah, yeah. and that's, that's why they're also eligible for the vaccine now in some states due to if your BMI is a certain amount is in the obesity rate. I don't know if that applies to children yet, but I know for adults, that is the case. So that is also now a health risk, COVID-19. All right, well, that is definitely a robust explanation. Um, we're going to start uh, going into the resource finding portion of the PowerPoint presentation. So um, this is where I basically quickly go over a resource and then kind of click on it, show you what it looks like, and then help you navigate through it. 
My personal favorite place to start um, when I don't know something with regards to health information is Medline Plus, which I briefly mentioned already. It is a free online medical database, much more reliable than what I call Dr. Google. <laughs> so um, I'm going to show you quickly what its child nutrition page looks like. Here you go. As you can see right away, no ads, no billions upon billions of links to who knows where. It's specifically done under child nutrition. And then on here, it even has like, uh, you can quickly go to, for instance, the game section on the page, go directly to the teenager section and it takes you all the way down here. Um, I like to call these, this website a gateway website because most of its pages is comprised of helpful links to other reliable organizations such as the Nemours Foundation, Department of Agriculture, National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases. And it's just, it just looks really neat and accessible, easy to read. You can pick out multiple languages if you so choose. And um, it's always, and no matter what it um, is about, it always tells you who's reviewed it and when it's been recently updated and so forth. And then we have uh, my website, which I run, the uh, Parenting and Children's Health section of the Dr. Stephen Mickley Community Health Resource section. I'll just quickly show you that. No, oh, sorry, one second. I gotta click out of this first. Apologize for that. So this is what my page looks like. On the website, we have a whole link under life stages, you go to parenting and children's health. We have websites that you can jump to specifically for parenting and children's health. Uh, quick links through here. And we have allergies and asthma. All the way down, we have nutrition. And we, we are, some of the websites that I'm talking about tonight and the organizations, they're right here already. So it's very easy to access. And then last but not least, um, while this is primarily on REN resources that I'm sharing tonight, I did find a reading list from eatright.org that I can share with you right now. Not only does it have a reading list for children, but it also has reading lists for, you know, celiac disease, um, the uh, Dietetics Complete Food and Nutrition Guide, weight loss, anything on diabetes, uh, sports nutrition, and just nutrition and lifestyle. A lot of things to choose from. All of these are recently created from out of 2019 from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. So this is definitely a lot to start with if you're more literature oriented, as opposed to like not wanting to be on your screen and looking through these websites. I like to provide literary resources as well. So um, our first topic is recommended nutrition intake. If you're not aware of how much a child needs to be having in protein, how much calories they should be having per day, the uh, Dietary Guidelines for Americans uh, 2020 to 2025 edition or the ninth edition is where you wanna start. It's created by the US Department of Agricultural, Agriculture, provides advice on what to eat and drink to meet nutrition needs, promote health and help prevent chronic disease. It includes nutritional recommendations by life stage um, from birth through older adults, which includes women who are pregnant or lactating. So they do have a section on children's nutrition. And the new recommendations for 2020 highlights the importance of avoiding added sugar with new recommendation for no added sugar under two years old, which is really important, to, particularly if you want to in, at, at their birth and as they're getting, because you want to instill those healthy habits as soon as possible. So I think that's a great recommendation. So this is the link. If you click on this picture, it takes you straight away to these dietary guidelines. And it basically just looks like this, that's the cover. And then you click download PDF and it shows you like the really long, long chapter section that is the dietary guidelines. Um, if you don't have time to read the whole thing or because there is a lot of information in there, you can just go to the executive summary, download it here in either English or Spanish. There's also a consumer resources page, which has a lot more on here, it has a brochure version of it. It has the healthy eating on a budget and the My Plate plan, 
which we talked about earlier. So it's just so you don't have to waste your time reading the entire thing. You can just go to the executive summary and show you exactly what it says with regards to children nutrition. And then we also have a page from the Mayo Clinic website, which has a really health, really easy to look at chart. So right here, if your child is ages two to four, it has the calories, the protein, fruit, vegetables, grains, dairy, all the food groups, and exactly measured in cups and calories, like how much they need. And it goes all the way up to ages 14 to 18. And they do separate it by daily guidelines for girls, daily guidelines for boys. So I think this is really helpful for some new parents, especially just so they can have this as a reference. Um, they also talk about the added sugar here, sodium, less saturated trans fats, and just to combine a bunch of nutrient dense foods from all the major food groups listed here. Uh, is there anything you wanted to add to this, Sarah? No, nope, that's great, great resources. Yeah, um, I'm sure um, do many people in your profession uh, refer to the Dietary Guidelines for Americans? Sure, yes, um, especially when when you recommend, we'll, we'll get used to these recommendations and then they'll make some, some new ones. So of course we always wanna stay up on the most recent with again, to echo what you said, um, big change, no added sugar under two years old and to circle back to obesity, uh, we wanna set set children up for success um, and food preferences that are going to nourish their bodies as best as possible. Mm -hmm. It's great to know that, you know, medical professionals are relying on the same resources as the usual average consumer. So that when they make their diagnoses, it's like, you know, we're on, the patient and the doctor is on the same page or nutritionist, sure. I should say. So that's good. So children specific education, what websites are accessible to children and if you're an educator what can you recommend so that children can learn on their own and in their own unique way uh, more about nutrition so it's not just on the parent to learn you can you can recommend these websites to your children so they can learn on their own first we have myplate.gov which i mentioned earlier and they have a whole just for kids section here um, you have the games and apps section, you can print out activity sheets for them. They can click on any of these and find out more about uh, drinking, what kind of whole grains to try. Um, they can even uh, access a can you pledge to eat healthy, you can print out this little certificate and add it to the fridge for them. And then you, this is the games and apps section so you can see there's a variety for them to try out. Uh, breakfast around the world, track and field fuel up, you know, for those sporty ones. Um, so I know we're trying not to keep them online, but there is, while they are already virtual learning, why not have them also learn something really important, which is taking after their own nutrition. So, and you could even recommend it to your children's health teacher or their, you know, just their general teacher. If I'm sure they're already like busy trying to find resources to the, to you know, teach their child, your child. So you can always recommend it to your teacher, to the, your children's teacher as a teaching method. Next, we have the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. They have a section on tips to help children maintain a healthy weight. This is easy to understand. Um, um, they also have uh, games on here as well. Uh, down on the bottom, uh, body, mind, best bones forever, the blast off game, and the child and teen BMI calculator. So you could even teach your child how to calculate their own BMI, which is pretty neat. And then last but not least, we have from Nemours, the kids health website, which has its own set of games on here. And uh, they have a, yeah, so daily brain answer, big questions. And I think staying under staying healthy, they can talk about food in a way, and they can read, these are articles that they can print out maybe for school or for their own reading. As you can see, it's just very easy to read, not a lot of big words, a lot of white space. So they're not gonna feel overwhelmed by the amount of information that's on here. Obviously it's printable, 
kids can listen to it instead of reading it, can change the font on here. And it's also available in Spanish, should the kid be um, ESL. I think it's, yes, yeah, it's ENL now. Yeah, it changes. <laughs> Um, so, and then last but not least, um, while there are libraries right now that are no contact pickup right now, um, you can visit your local public library or search on the website Goodreads for picture or chapter books that emphasize healthy eating. This is one such book that I've been recommended to by a children's librarian in Greenwich um, Library, Public Library, The Boy Who Loved Broccoli by Sarah A. Creighton. Um, and this book is just one book that's part of a list that I found online for uh, children's books, specifically on broccoli. It's very broccoli oriented, this list. So we have Monsters Don't Eat Broccoli, The Boy Who Loved Broccoli, Broccoli Dreams, Broccoli Carrots, Beans. <laughs> so it's just because um, when you're a child and I'm sure all of us remember reading, having read to us by our parents, it's good to start modeling um, healthy eating in whatever way you can as early as, the, as, you, as you can. So this reading, while you're teaching them to read, teach them about vegetables at an early age as you're reading, make it a fun activity, make them associate learning and fun with healthy eating. So that's one other resource you can use. Uh, Sarah, do you have any other recommendations for websites or are these? Yeah, that was great. Sometimes making it about uh, the boy in the story or the girl in the story versus your child can take some of the pressure off. So I think that's a that's a great low pressure way to introduce some of those ideas. Oh, that's a really good point. Yeah, I didn't even think of that. That's a good one. <laughs> um, so websites with kid friendly recipes. I had several people who answered the questionnaire prior to this um, during registration that they are wanting to know recipes for uh, websites with recipes on them. So first we have nutrition.gov. From also from the US Department of Agriculture, where my plate is from. Okay, so right here we have under home, you go to recipes, and under recipes, there's recipe search. And over here, we have the category already set to kid friendly. You can also set it to snack, lunch, breakfast. Um, there's food groups. Um, you can narrow it down to vegetable, grains, protein, fruits, and dairy and even narrow it down to the season. So if your child wants to have something fresh for the summer, you know, you can try confetti yogurt pops and that looks really good actually, I might try that. Doesn't have to be, it, just because it's kid friendly doesn't mean adults can't enjoy it either. In fact, the reason for kid friendly recipes is that you can make it a fun activity for the whole family. So, you know, the parents are usually in the kitchen and we're trying to get the kids out because we don't want them to you know throw knives around or something <laughs> but most of these recipes are kid friendly because it's safe for them to make so that's also why i'm recommending them having some them to learn to cook and associating cooking healthy foods at a fun age with fun is important so also on the Nemore site for kids health if you go under kids you go to recipes and cooking that's what this, how you get to this page. So recipes for kids, vegetarian recipes for kids, and also the infamous lactose intolerant recipes. I wish there was more, but <laughs> that's what we got so far. Um, oh, it looks like they have more right here. So for those poor children who are, who cannot do anything with milk, um, but even if that's the case, you can always just substitute the dairy milk for another type of milk, such as almond, oat, soy, there's a lot of options now for lactose intolerant kids. So just because it's not listed here doesn't mean you can't just substitute the dairy for another type of milk. So then we have foodhero.org, which is a website created by the Oregon um, State University. So they have a lot of kid approved recipes, which means that they actually took a poll from kids in Oregon and they rated which ones here were really good. And then in addition to recipes, they also have a section for coloring sheets, activity sheets, videos, games, story time, and poetry. So just, this is a really, it's a free website. And whenever you click on a recipe, for instance, this tasty looking hamburger skillet, it tells you the directions, all the ingredients, 
notes, any comments made by people who might have other recommendations. And they also have, most importantly, the nutrition facts. So right here, you can decide based on this whether you want whether you want the right amount of calories. If you want to have more dietary fiber in your children's diet, you can see right here where the dietary fiber is. And we got to make sure we got those vitamins and supplements and such. So in another, um, if I had more time, I would go over how to read nutrition labels because that's a whole other thing that a child should learn at an early age and including most adults, but that'll have to be a separate webinar. And then last but not least, we have the American Heart Association websites for recipes. I'm sorry, the internet is so slow. For some reason, the links are taking me to Internet Explorer, <laughs> which is why it's taking so long. But um, from what I remember, it's basically the same formatting. They just have different recipes entirely. I, I liked to, as much, there might be some overlap in recipes in between all these websites, but um, I think more variety, the better. As you can see, um, there's these Green Monster smoothies. Um, and let's see, I think you can browse categories. See, yep. So main dishes, chicken, poultry, vegetarian, slow cooker, snacks, and beef. So for these recipes, if you're trying to find something like keto or like Whole30, that's unfortunately not going to be the case because a lot of these websites don't want to promote diets specifically. And I'm sure Sarah has a lot to say with regards to trying to get your child to be on the same diet as you, but I have been told that that is really not a recommendation. Um, most, place, most, most of the websites that I've done research on, they recommend that they just have the recommended intake nutrition of those major food groups that we talked about earlier, and that's it. So don't try to uh, subscribe your kids to your diet until they get older and make that decision for themselves. Um, instead, use these recipes and try have your child just pick as pick what they want based on what's there. And I think the element of choice is what's going to be really important, specifically when we talk about picky eaters. So. Uh, Sarah, before I move on, is there anything you wanted to add? Nope, that was great. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's move on to physical activity because this is a webinar on both nutrition and exercise. And um, I did get a few registrants talking about how they want more um, ideas for activities, especially now that we're supposed to be indoors. But with spring coming back and the vaccinations, we might want to encourage our children and ourselves to move around more. So uh, just like there were dietary guidelines, there's also physical activity guidelines for Americans. Right now, there was only the second edition. Oops, all right, let me try that again. Yeah, so this is where the website would be and you are able to download the complete second edition or to just check out the executive summary, which looks like this and is only a few pages. And um, as you can see, uh, what's new in this edition, it provides guidance to help people ages three years and older improve their health through participation in regular physical activity, and it allow, uh, outlines the amounts and types of physical activity recommended for different ages and populations, which is just as important as knowing the specific nutrition intake for children, because we always want to burn off what we ingest. So. Um, the two websites that I would recommend are um, from the National Blood, Lung, and Heart Institute. They have a promotion called We Can, and they refer to as We Can Move, basically. Um, ways to enhance children's activity and nutrition. They have healthy weight basics. What is a healthy weight? How to calculate body mass index is also here. Um, and then we're going to go with Get Your Family Started. Um, they have a lot of tips just for parents on how to uh, encourage their children to get active and eat right. And in the get active section, they do have a lot of resources and uh, uh, PDFs or handouts that you can print out. You can learn fun ways to uh, encourage healthy eating and getting active. Ask your kids for ideas. That's a good one. <laughs> Hopefully that idea won't involve video games or Fortnite. 
But um, there are a lot of, speaking of video games, there are a lot of video games that do encourage movement, however. I know that Just Dance is really good for movement and there's this game on Nintendo Switch. I cannot remember the name, but it does, um, incur it does make you physically move in order to complete objectives and such. So your kids might know that game. So if they are into video games, try to align their interests to something that would make them active. And if they're already into sports, then that's pretty easy already. So these are just some of the ideas that might be on here. They even have a section for how to reduce screen time. So there's just a lot to go in here. Um, definitely take a look on your own time. Highly recommend it. And then we already looked at this page before, but this is also from the Center for Disease Control. Um, how to be physically active while social distancing. We're gonna be going over that later and under special circumstances, but it does link to the physical activity guidelines as well. And it talks about the three types of physical activity that must be included each week, aerobic, muscle strengthening, and bone strengthening. Um, they will also be going over tips on how to get active. And they, uh, that's a separate page for um, ideas, starting early, setting a positive example. Basically, you can't just have your child do it, you have to participate as well. And I know it can be hard to, to do that with to balance your work with being healthy, but if you're going to encourage your child to be healthy, you have to model it for them. Because kids learn by modeling, especially when they're young. So uh, anything to add, Sarah? Nope. Okay, so uh, state and local support resources. So like I said, Connecticut is where I'm based. So that's, that's why I'm sharing Connecticut resources. The first being the Department of Public Health. If you go on their website and look up obesity, they have what's called the Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Obesity Prevention Program. So they basically um, go over everything that we talked about with regards to obesity stats, um, the uh, health risk associated with obesity. They even talk about sugar-sweetened beverages and how that's been contributing to obesity rate because sodas and juices are basically just drinking liquid sugar in most cases. Um, they have references that we've gone over uh, state is specifically for Connecticut, and also um, some of their own uh, program uh, supplements, such as the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Education Program, which people can apply to, that allocates funding for nutrition um, uh, companies. Um, they also have specific activities that they can do in schools and other organizations. And with regards to um, doing activities uh, that are physical, they are also in partnership with Bike Walk Connecticut and the Department of Transportation to promote uh, biking lanes, to teach people how to uh, be a good pedestrian and uh, bicyclists so that they are safe on the street. They link to here for, an, oh, I forgot that link doesn't work. So if you go to the Department of Transportation, um, they have a complete streets and bicycle pedestrian resources. So if you wanted to start having bicycling as an activity for the whole family, this is where you want to get started. Um, you can figure out how to make a route, how to, uh, how, which bike lanes are safe for the cyclist, what the hand signals you need to know about are for. And just, this is primarily for Connecticut. So I'm sorry for you, um, New York State residents, but I'm sure if you go on the New York State or Westchester.gov websites, they'll have something similar to this. Next, we have Get Healthy CT. And this is definitely something that's applicable no matter where you are located. It doesn't have to be just CT. because so they have a lot of great stuff on here. Um, this is the healthy food section. They have uh, sub sub subject headings for um, all the eat fruits, vegetables, rethink your drinks, a lot of great links. Um, they, what's great about this one, if you live in Connecticut, they have a local farmer's market and food resources. So if you wanna start going to a place that, in, that has locally grown and healthy food, um, this is where you would go. Um, unfortunately, they're not open yet, but this is where you would go if they were. 
it's a great resource if you want to know if there's local farmers in your area who are selling. Um, so we have a physical activity page. They've got dance, they got physical tracking tools like my fitness pal, which you just download on your phone for free. They've got physical activity guides. They got monthly health challenges so that if you want to start, you know, exercising little by little, they have different uh, exercises for different parts of your body. Uh, you can download one full year of these health challenges, see how you do. And then from there you can build up, you know, a healthy pattern. Consistency is key when it comes to exercise and building good form. Um, so you got the wellness tips here um, for diabetes resources, heart health, and also the dangers of tobacco and how to help you quit. And then we also have what's a monthly wellness feature. They have one for adults or general, and then they also have one that they keep updating for children. So you can also go here and go back to the archives where it has a lot, not just on children's nutrition, but like children's health in general, a lot of great stuff in here. Most of these are handouts or articles, you know, that are reliable and peer reviewed. So this is just so much in here. Oh, not to mention, we were talking about balancing your workplace life with exercise. They've got a lot of workplace wellness ideas for parents and just people in general who may be working late like we are right now, me and Sarah, <laughs> who may not have time to uh, really focus on exercise the way we want to. So we got uh, wellness idea tips that you can look up right here. I think the most recent one I read was actually they gave an example of like a hospital map and then they had um, they had uh, people map out which route through the hospital would take an hour or be the equivalent of a mile. So that when you walk through it on your lunch break, you're basically guaranteeing that you're at least walking a mile a day. Even if you can't leave the building, you're still getting your steps in. So, you know, that's just one workplace wellness idea that I found on here. So then we have Yale New Haven Health's Yale New Haven Children's Hospital website, which is what Sarah would know about. <laughs> um, I don't I don't think I added the link to here, unfortunately. So um, but it, it should be pretty it's it's pretty similar to just Greenwich Hospital's regular website. Right. And I'm sure you'll be able to find Sarah's contact information there as well, as well as information about the center that she works for. So I would definitely look that up. And then we also have Greenwich's Hospital Center for Behavioral and Nutritional Health. So I'll just quickly bring that up because I do have the link for that. So um, not only do they um, offer nutritional counseling, they also uh, provide services for the promotion of health and wellness, management and prevention of acute and chronic medical conditions. They treat all sorts of conditions, including food allergies, um, weight related to psychological problems, because a lot of problems related to nutrition can be psychological. And once they, they provide, you know, psychologists there as well for that reason, which is why the part about behavioral health is just as important. So, um, so um, is there anything you wanted to add, Sarah? Because the next few slides are going to be all you. So. This is the last portion of the um, webinar. We're gonna be talking about special circumstances. So I'll let Sarah take it away. Great, so as we've really reviewed here, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought new challenges to families, which can make new or existing health struggles more, even more complicated. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Um, so healthy eating and exercise during a pandemic a good place to start is setting small goals to get back some sense of normalcy. So was it typical that the before the pandemic that you did these things and now we've lost track of that or will this be a new change? Either way, um, setting small goals such as meal and snack timing consistency, limiting grazing outside of those designated eating times as best as we can. That can actually be helpful for everyone, but I work with children. so either those that are carrying more weight than we might expect or less, um, a grazing habit can impact appetite at meal and snack times that might be more structured and offer foods with more nourishment. Um, like Veronica 
love, nicely said, um, planned physical activity for the whole family whenever possible. So it's great if they are willing to go outside and play in the yard um, by themselves or with a sibling, but involving the whole family to make it a more lasting or lengthy activity is, is ideal. Um, limiting screen time outside of what is absolutely necessary in favor for activities that get that get children moving and a compromise could certainly look like just dance where they're still inside they're still comfortable um but we are asking them to move their body a little bit and, and uh, just to be clear these these three links are just uh websites and also one handout with regards to more tips for how to be physically active during this time um, and the one in the middle, food and food system resources are actually really helpful links for those who are having, tr who are from low income families or who are having trouble getting access to healthy foods, especially if they're on a budget. So there's a lot of great resources for those in that specific uh, situation. Wonderful. Um, so those with food allergies or, or general allergies and asthma, um, any food allergy should be diagnosed by a pediatric allergist with proper testing, which could include blood work or skin testing. Um, sometimes we use the umbrella term of being allergic to something without really knowing if that needs to be excluded from the diet. And the goal of everyone on the care team in pediatrics is to get that child to eat as many foods as they safely can to not over restrict. Oral food challenges are tools that are used within clinics to ensure that um, foods are added back safely. And that could have been, you know, possible past reactions that we now need to see in clinic what, what might happen that's done in a very controlled environment. Um, and eligibility for something like that is determined by the pediatric allergist. That being food allergies, food sensitivities are not as well described in medical literature. It's a bit of a gray area. Popular tests are available commercially, but they are not supported by medical evidence. So my advice would always be to see a pediatric allergist um, versus trying to diagnose at home. Again, just to prevent over-restricting and eliminating unnecessary foods. Asthma action plans should be put into place to allow for safe day-to-day -day activities, as well as if we are asking them to exercise a bit more to make sure that that is safe for them. Just to go back on um, what you spoke about with food sensitivities, what what can you give an example of a popular test that someone might use? Because I didn't know, I don't know what that means by popular test. Like, is that like something you can buy at a pharmacy or something? I see them um, advertised on TV. I, I'm hesitant to call one out by brand in case anyone does find helpfulness, but basically, how, how they operate is they will check a certain blood level that our labs actually won't test because it's, it's not proven to be um, medically sound in piece of information. And it, those levels can actually be elevated if that food is in the diet, mm -hmm. not necessarily if it's a food that needs to be avoided. And what do you, have you had any parents try to uh, tell you that, oh, we'll just keep exposing them to the food they're allergic and they'll eventually get immune? I'm sure that's popular. Generally, it's the opposite. Generally, parents are very quick to take a food out of the diet um, because in the case of true fruit allergy, that's something very scary that, that people don't want to want to see again. Um, so generally, if a parent have, has seen something that could progress to anaphylaxis, they're, they're pretty cautious around that food and rightfully so. Um, but sometimes other cases like they had a bellyache or um, they seemed off, they were fussy or those types of things are a little bit more nondescript. And I'm more hesitant to say, oh yes, avoid that food without either finding out how often they've had that food, how many times the symptom occurred, and do they need to go see a food allergist? Okay, and then lastly, um, can you give an example of an asthma action plan? Like if, for instance, um, the child can't really run that much, is there like an alternative such as, I guess it would be walking, but what if like they want to join the track team or something and you have to tell them, what would you tell them? 
who defer to the pediatric pulmon pulmonology doctor who also, I, since I work in the specialty center, I, I work with all those different specialists. Um, and an asthma action plan could include something based off of their pulmonary function. And that is um, a test that looks at like baseline, how their oxygenation is doing, and then is running a reasonable ask, or is their pulmonary function a little bit lower and then is walking a reasonable ask. So I would defer to the pulmonologist and any of their testing, um, but action plans could include cer certain medications, certain daily medications, certain medications that are only as needed, those types of things. Yeah, and I'm sure it depends on the child, yeah. Certainly. Um, and then the two um, links below are the websites that I would recommend for further information. Um, the Asthma and Allergy Foundation America is great, especially for parents. So definitely check that out. And then last but not least, we have picky eaters. So, so this is something I see across all of the specialties at our center, um, whether they're here for GI or urology or cardiology, um, selective eating, knows no um, diagnosis or child in particular, we can all struggle with that and all kids can struggle with that. The education that I provide for selective eaters and their parents is a, is a little bit of, it could be a change in how households kind of operates or practices. And that's really delineating who's responsible for what in the house. And what I encourage is this division of responsibility where parents set when foods are served and what foods are served. The child then determines whether those foods are accepted and how much they have. Whenever the child set, tries to set when they're gonna eat something or what they're going to eat, that might not be in line with what as parents we know is their nutrition goals for the day or the week or the month or the year. Um, it might be coming more from a want versus a need. And whenever parents try to dictate whether the food is accepted and how much is accepted, the child can perceive that as pressure and that can backfire. They can shut down. That meal might not be successful. That might not, meal might not be as successful as it might have been. They may become more reliant on the foods that they prefer versus the foods that we're serving. Um, so I, I really encourage we try not to cross those boundaries and, and that power struggle can really develop which can make for really unpleasant meal times. Um, picky eating habits likely didn't happen overnight. And so it's gonna take time of that implementation of that division of responsibility to see an improvement. Um, as I kind of referenced, offering both prefer preferred foods and non-preferred foods at meals, um, at snacks, at least once daily or whenever is possible to increase that exposure. So if you were to tell me that um, a child will only eat macaroni and cheese at dinner, that doesn't mean that we have to stop serving macaroni and cheese completely, but maybe they're served the macaroni and cheese in addition to chicken or broccoli or rice or whatever else the rest of the family is eating, where we would categorize mac and cheese as the preferred food and the foods that they're less likely to eat as the non-preferred foods, but even that exposure, that offering of those foods is an intervention and it, it will be helpful over time, probably not immediately, but we're showing them that you're not always in charge of what's being served. These foods are safe foods for you um, and they're welcome to try them when they're ready. Lastly, I'll finish with um, for this slide that children will live up to the labels we give them. So I try not to label them as a picky eater and I would encourage you to do the same. Um, if they hear that enough, they're gonna say, oh yeah, I'm just a picky eater. I have no reason to try these new foods. I have no reason to, act, to do what is being modeled for me because I'm a picky eater. Yeah, I was, I was gonna say, um, I, it's not just like children, but I think a lot of adults or have become picky eaters because they have not, their parents did not use these specific type of tips. And once they have kids, they'll bring those same habits down to them, which is unfortunate, but it does happen. 
I, I really recommend people check out those kid-friendly websites that we mentioned earlier with specifics to that because all those kid-friendly recipes have something that kids will like in addition to having something healthy within them. That's the reason that they're called kid-friendly recipes. Um, and the link down here is a really helpful article with tips and more um, to what Sarah was talking about. And um, basically just involving children in the process, I think is the most important thing because um, let's say for instance, you have a garden and you grow vegetables. Well, have the child become a process of growing those vegetables to it. They, they feel like they're contributing. They might be more likely to eat it as well. Is that, is that logic sort of correct, Sarah? Absolutely, that could definitely be a tip on here, including them in whatever process is reasonable. If going out to the garden and planting and picking and that type of thing is, is reasonable, helping, letting them help stir, letting them pick the recipe, however we can involve them is, is tremendously helpful. Not to mention gardening is one of the activities that they encourage for, to get more exercise in your day, not just for adults, but for children. So you can kind of get two in one right there, both nutrition and exercise that way. So I think, I think that's important to add. So uh, I believe that's it. Oh, wow. All right. We're just coming up on five minutes after seven. So I apologize for running a little bit over. Um, if there are any questions that the attendees would like to ask, please use the uh, Q&A um, button on the bottom of your screen to write out your question. Specify who you would like it to answer to. Um, either Sarah or myself. And um, just so you all know, uh, this is where you have to go to find the recording. For though, if you want, if you know somebody who couldn't make it but still wants to know about this, you go to this Dr. Stephen Mickley Community Health Resource section. You go to webinar recordings, which is this green tab right here, and it's going to be posted under food and nutrition right over here. And you can also take a look at the other things I've done since last year. Um, this website's, um, I'm going to post the link on here, but you can also access this website from the uh, Greenwich Hospital uh, website, the general website. And uh, I will be having another uh, two webinars this month, one on where to find kidney resources and one on uh, wellness apps for patients. And you can register for those and more. Uh, on this uh, events page or by calling this number. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna stop talking now so that people have a moment to write their questions if they have any. And uh, down here we have both of our contact information. Is Sarah, is this contact information correct for you? Absolutely. Okay, yep. And she is based in Greenwich. So if anybody is local or is willing to drive up from Westchester, I highly suggest you seek her out. She is very knowledgeable and thank you so much for participating in this webinar by the way thanks for having me as my first guest speaker that's quite an honor <laughs> <laughs> yeah so sarah sasha says thank you both great info looking forward to trying new recipes with my daughter i hope she really likes them and uh if you're on the next webinar let us know which one she likes we'd like we'd love to know what um um people who are local and who are in westchester what what they prefer here because it might be different from what kids, for instance, in Oregon would like in terms of a snack. Um, let's see, we have still the participants. We still have Jan, Alexandra, and Susan. Um, do you guys have any questions for us? I understand that it's over seven, so I, I'm sure people want to get going with their dinner plans and. Uh, so um, if there's no other, oh, I think I have something else up here. Oh, no, thanks. This was great information. Okay, great. Thank you, Susan. All right, so um, I'm gonna let us go then. Um, again, this recording will be up on the website. Thank you everyone who attended. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you so much, Liz Gabriel from the Lewisboro Library for helping to expand my audience. And thank you, Al Cusano for moderating and setting up this Zoom session. So uh, we're just going to end for tonight. Thank you all and uh, have a good night. Thanks, Veronica. Bye.